Lucius Licinius Murina, Consul 62 BCE. A new man and accomplished legate, Lucius Murina defeated Catiline for the second consular spot in 62, thus dashing Catiline's electoral hopes and driving him to take desperate measures. It was Murina's success, in other words, which sparked the Catilinarian conspiracy. However, this victory required some rather blatant bribery on the part of Murina, and also some work on the part of his Uptimitate allies to pull off. One of the other candidates in that race, Servius Sulpicius Rufus, prosecuted Murina for electoral bribery, resulting in a high-stakes, high-profile courtroom drama unfolding alongside of the Catilinarian conspiracy. Murina was acquitted and went on to serve as consul, but not before Cicero wrote and delivered pro Murina on his behalf, thus preserving for posterity many details of Murina's career, which would have otherwise been lost to history. After passing a law which helped the Optimates prepare to wage a war of political obstruction on Pompey the Great, Murina departed from both Rome's highest office and the historical record, never to be heard from again. Although his career was markedly less dramatic than the careers of either his father or his son, the middle Murina was still a significant player in high-stakes political theater. Given what we know about the norms of late Republic politics, Murina was not necessarily a good candidate for the consulship on paper. On the one hand, he was a new man. And we know that new men were at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis their patrician and noble plebeian opponents. Roman voters tended to favor people with high name recognition. At the same time, the more well-heeled your family was, the more connections that you had, and those connections could help you turn out votes. However, while Murina was fairly new to politics in terms of his family's lineage, he was still pretty well positioned, and compared with any other new man that I've ever studied, I think he might actually be the person who is the best positioned to make a run at the consulship. His father, who also shared his name, had been pretty famous, and he had also hitched the family's fortunes to Sulla and to Sulla's various high-level successors. We'll come back and talk about the elder Lucius Murina in a bit. Despite being from a family that was fairly new to senatorial status, the Murinai, as advocates of the Solans, were aligned with the Optimate faction, which became prominent and even dominant between the late 80s and down to the late 60s. So effectively, for almost the entirety of Murina's career, the political faction that he belonged to would be in the ascendant. The elder and younger Murina were both on great terms with Lucullus, the general who started out the Third Mithridatic War. And it appears that Murina, while probably not tied at the hip to Pompey, was at least on decent terms with him and that his holding power was not offensive to Pompey. It's worth keeping in mind that Pompey was another famous Sola protege. So this means that all of the major players, at least many of the major players in Roman politics at the time were friendly or at worst neutral to Murina's rising to power. Although Murina's father did not achieve the consulship, he did win a good deal of fame, and since they had the same name, this fame would have been especially useful. Murina had accompanied Sulla as a legate during the Second Mithridatic War, and when Sulla had gone to Italy to fight the Civil War, Murina the Elder had stayed behind as his representative in the east, with command of some of the troops left in the area. His orders were most likely just to keep order and watch the border, but the Elder Murina took the initiative, started a new war, and managed to win a major victory. He won a triumph for his efforts, but was not rewarded with the consulship. It's unclear whether he ran or not. But despite the success, the elder Murina would never become consul, even though he would live for at least another decade and probably closer to two more decades. I imagine the reason why he was never given a consulship is because he had disobeyed Sulla's orders and he was seen as something of a loose cannon. There also wasn't necessarily as strong of a correlation between military success and political success as we tend to think today. We tend to look at someone like Gaius Marius and see someone whose military deeds made him a public hero, 
And although Murana the Elder did celebrate a triumph and people would recognize and remember his name, he didn't do anything which was considered truly heroic. So this was not putting him on a level where he was now a national hero. It was just making him a big player, if that makes sense. As for the younger Murana, he actually served as a legate during this campaign where his father started a war in the east. And so by the time that he was of age to run for offices such as the Keistership, he already had a good deal of command experience under his belt and he was ready to take advantage of any opportunities that his office holding would give him in order to gain further distinction. We don't know all of the details of Murana's service since our sources aren't always very informative when it comes to the actions of individual legates and they often don't even name them all. But it is possible that Murana had gained further experience as a legate before 74 and in 74 that was the year when he served as Keister. A year later after his term expired he went with Lucullus as a legate to the third Mithridatic war. He already knew the area well, he had served there under his father, and he was useful for his knowledge of the area. Mirana, the younger, was seen as being reliable enough that Lucullus entrusted him with an entire legion and an independent operation against Amesis in 72. Mirana took the single legion and managed to conduct a successful siege of the city. He then went back to Rome for a while. Between 70 and 66, he also went back to the east, this time not as a legate, but rather as a representative. And he was there to advise Lucullus on organizing the territory that they had conquered from Mithridates. It's also possible that the person on the embassy was actually his father, Murana the Elder, but it seems more likely given his father's advanced age by this point that it was actually Murana the Younger, whose experience was much more recent. So. He, at this point, he had quite a bit of experience, and also his ties with Lucullus were very deep. And also, perhaps more importantly, his ties with Lucullus's veterans, who were quite numerous. Due to Cicero's pro Murana, we know a fair amount of detail about Murana's early career. A large part of Cicero's argument revolves around how Murana usually got choice assignments by lot when he was elected to each office. And we see that there's a lot to be said for this. We know that he was elected Keister in 74, and we don't know what assignment he got, but Cicero tells us that his later consular opponent, Sulpicius, got a much less favorable assignment at Ostia. So presumably the lot favored Murana a bit more than Sulpicius. We also know that Murana never held the office of the Aedile ship. The Aedile ship was important for people who had low name recognition because it was a way to curry favor with the people by putting on great games. However, it took a lot of money to hold this office because you were expected to use your own private resources to some extent to fund public entertainment. And because the Miranai were new to Roman politics, they most likely did not have the kind of fabulous wealth that many previous Aediles had used in order to gain popularity. I say they probably didn't have this kind of wealth because I don't really know how much they benefited from the Sullen prescriptions, but I imagine that they did line their pockets to some extent. That being said, neither father nor son was present when they were going on because of the war with Mithridates that Murana the Elder was waging. So most likely they were not winning a ton of money out of the prescriptions, although they probably got something out of the East in terms of plunder. But at any rate, the Murani were not on the same level as, say, Crassus or Pompey or Lucullus or some of the other fabulously wealthy people in Rome. However, the disadvantage that Murana faced for not holding the Aedile ship was completely and totally offset when he was elected Praetor in 65 and then, by lot, got the choice assignment of being the urban Praetor. What this meant is not only was he able to make up for not being Aedile by putting on magnificent games to increase his popularity, but a lot of what he put on was public funded, and he was given a de facto exemption from the rule that said that there had to be a certain number of years which elapsed between someone putting on private games and running for consul. So his opponents, some of whom may have been wealthier, had not been able to take advantage of putting on games in recent years. 
whereas Murina, who served in 65, was then able to run in the summer of 63 for Office of 62, meaning that people still remembered the games that he put on. So if anything, all of this ended up working out to his benefit. This was way more beneficial than having been a successful edile. So again, the lot seems to have liked Mirana quite a bit, and the Romans thought that the lot represented the will of the gods. So make of that what you will. According to Cicero, Mirana didn't do all that well in the Praetorian election of 65 because his name recognition at Rome was not all that high. He says this is because while Mirana had a lot of accomplishments as a soldier and administrator, the people in Rome had not seen him work in that capacity. So he decided that he needed to rectify that problem before trying to run for consul. Accordingly, he decided to opt for a pro Praetorian governorship and he was awarded with one in Transalpine Gaul. He took this time, Cicero says, in order to cultivate new and useful friendships. People who could help him in the election included the equestrian moneylenders. So in Transalpine Gaul, Murana made his troops available to the moneylenders so that they could collect their debts and get paid. Later on, the implication is that these men willingly contributed money to Murana and that helped put him over the top. Also, we have to remember that the equestrians often formed a large percentage of some of the voting tribes in Roman elections. So gaining a lot of popularity with the equestrians was a good way to make sure that you were a viable candidate. So yes, um, also if you are trying to argue against him being engaged in electoral bribery, this comment actually was not super well constructed since Cicero is admitting that Mirana has many moneylender friends and that he was deliberately cultivating their friendship. Usually when candidates went to moneylenders, it was to get money they could use to bribe people to vote for them or to put on some sort of display which would impress people and to send out people to canvas for money. So um, this was a weird defense on Cicero's part. However, it does show some of the possibilities of what Roman governors get themselves into. And when Cicero is talking about Murana sending out troops to help collect debts, this is not denigrating the activity. He's basically saying that Murana was behaving in an intelligent way that was responsible and electorally viable. So it's a very different approach to ethics than what Cicero takes up in his speeches on Varies, where he talks about Varies' rapacity and how he was trying to milk Sicily dry. Really, when you're dealing with anything rhetorical or political, you always have to be careful since, in all cases, the context of whether or not the speaker supports the person they're talking about will very much color how they choose to interpret the events that they're reporting. Typically speaking, in July of every year, the consular election for the following year would be held. So in the summer of 63, there were four major candidates scoring off for the consulship of 62. They were Decimus Junius Silanus, Lucius Sergius Catalina, Servius Sulpicius Rufus, and our man Lucius Licinius Murana. This election was especially charged, however, as the reigning consul Cicero and many of his friends were firmly convinced that Catiline was plotting the downfall of the state. So while he was investigating Catiline, he was able to actually push back the election by a month in order to try to dampen Catiline's popularity and try to dig up enough dirt to disqualify him. While he did manage to delay the election by a month, he did not dig up sufficient dirt to prosecute Catiline, and so the election went forward. It seems to have been clear to Cicero and the Optimates that the person who was in the lead was Decimus Junius Silanus, who, as I've argued in the past, was an excellent politician who was a uh, sort of marriage politics genius. And the other person who was in second was Lucius Sergius Catalina, or as he's known to most English readers, Catiline, who was running on the, the policy of canceling debts. If things didn't change, then the man that Cicero and his friends saw as deeply dangerous, Catiline, would win the consulship after being denied a few times in the past. Cicero and the Optimates were pretty suspicious of Catiline and his agenda, so they were willing to do whatever it took in order to prevent him from winning the office. 
The question was, would they go with the patrician orator Servius Sulpicius Rufus or the new man soldier Lucius Licinius Murina? How and why the Optimates chose to back Murina over Sulpicius is not entirely clear. Sulpicius, as I said, is a patrician. He also was someone who seemed electorally viable from past elections. As he pointed out, he had finished first in all the races he had run where he and Murina were both candidates. That being said, Cicero in Pro Murina argues that Sulpicius was giving off some loser vibes going into the campaign as he was effectively saying that the whole thing was being rigged against him and he was threatening lawsuits against people such as Murina. So perhaps Cicero and others just thought that Sulpicius was not sufficiently popular to take down Catiline. Sulpicius, whatever his merits in the eyes of the Optimates, was not the most charismatic guy, even though he's an excellent speaker, and he also seems to have lacked much empathy for the common man. So most likely when they decided on Murina, it had something to do with Murina being a little more electable. It's also simply possible that as a Lucullus prodigy, Murina was pushed heavily by his patron, who was the most powerful and prestigious man within the Optimate faction. And without Lucullus' support, the Optimates couldn't really do much. Cicero, therefore, as the presiding consul, had the Senate vote to award Lucullus a delayed triumph for his efforts against Mithridates, which had the effect of bringing in a lot of his veterans to town. And since a lot of these men had served with Murina, they knew and liked him. So when they participated in the election that they normally would not have been present for, they voted as a block for Murina. The question is, did they vote for him because they recognized him and thought that he would be a good consul? Or was there some combination of these guys being present and being bribed? Or did the soldiers vote without bribery, but then some of Murina's supporters bribed other people to vote for him too? It's not entirely clear how Murina managed to get more votes than Catiline, but it is clear that many people, including Sulpicius and Catiline, were convinced that the election was stolen. So that leads us to some pretty dire consequences, not least of which was Catiline engaging in a conspiracy to overthrow Rome and Sulpicius filing a lawsuit against Murina where if Murina were to be convicted, not only would he lose his consulship, but he would also be expelled from the Senate and banned for life. So the stakes were rather high for our protagonist. In late 63, most Romans were bracing themselves for whatever might come out of Catiline's conspiracy. However, there was a sideshow if people were interested, and this was the trial for electoral bribery of one Lucius Murina. The charge was ambitus or electoral bribery, and as I said above, the penalty was not only that one would lose the office that they were running for, but also that they would be expelled from the Senate and banned from further political participation. So for Murina himself, the stakes were rather high, and I think there's a case to be made that the stakes were high for a few of the other players as well, and we'll get into that as we go. This trial ultimately emerged out of something like a division within the Optimate faction. On the one hand, most of the faction was glad that they had been able to stop Catiline, and that was what they saw as being most important. However, a minority led by the candidate who had lost, Servius Sulpicius Rufus, were convinced that the election had been fraudulent and that Roman norms and values had been violated. Therefore, they decided to prosecute Murina and try to get the consulship that way. Sulpicius was backed by Cato the Younger, who had been approached earlier about helping to rig the election, apparently, and his stance was that under no circumstance was ambitus ever acceptable. So they were the prosecutors in the case, and the defense was then led by the orator Hortensius, Crassus, and Cicero, the reigning consul and the king of the Roman law courts. This means that at the same time that Cicero is giving his speeches against Catiline and broadly trying to oversee the efforts to stamp out the conspiracy, 
he is also defending his would-be successor in court against Sulpicius Rufus, who is one of his best friends. This was indeed an odd situation and a rather weird time for the Optimides to have something like a mini civil war within their faction. At Myrna's trial, there were four different speeches. Two of them were by the prosecutors, Cato the Younger and Sulpicius, and the other two were by the defense attorneys, Hortensius and Cicero. We only have one of those speeches, but because Cicero was at pains to refute both Cato and Sulpicius, we have a fairly good picture of what went on during the trial. Cicero's speech also includes a detailed account of Murena's career, since a lot of Sulpicius's argument is that the fact that he lost to Murena in itself is evidence of some sort of fraud. Sulpicius points out that with his patrician heritage and the fact that he's finished first in prior elections, such as the Keistership and the Praetorship election, that this should be proof positive that the voters simply prefer him to Murena and that any result which had him finishing after Murena had to be fraudulent. However, Cicero decides that this is out of context and that there is additional context to consider. There are advantages that Murena had in his career and that's why we know, for instance, that Murena received more favorable assignments as Keistrid Praetor than Sulpicius did. He also makes the argument that soldiers have an inherent electoral edge over lawyers and orators. Romans tended to prefer men of action over men of thoughts. And this was something that actually does seem to be accurate in general. Although it must be said that orators also tended to do rather well in Roman politics. And we have plenty of consuls who were orators first and generals second, if at all. That nonetheless, though, if you're a new man, you're trying to make it, being a soldier is a more sure path, as Gaius Marius demonstrated. Cicero also points out that Murena did well in all of his assignments. And after that, though, he can't really deny that his friend Sulpicius is virtuous. But effectively, he excuses himself for siding against his friend by saying that Rome needs a consul who will continue his policies as the Catalinarian threat continues, and also that by siding with Murena, he was really getting himself in good with the Optimates. And it's pretty stunning that he actually more or less says this explicitly in his speech. He's just talking about his own political ambitions in a defense speech of another man, but that's effectively what he does say. Uh, Cicero was very proud of the fact that he was now associating with the high rollers in Rome, and at the same time, the guy he's defending is a fellow new man who also is an optimate. So they're kind of like blood brothers. We don't know a lot of details about how Cicero privately thought about Murena from his correspondence. However, we have no evidence that he secretly disliked him or anything of that nature. So most likely, he did mean some of the praise that he directed Murena's way. Whatever the truth of the charges of Ambitus, uh, Murena was indeed acquitted as one would imagine, given that he had both Cicero and Hortensius, the first and second best lawyers in Rome, on his side. And it's not clear if there was any lasting damage from this election for Murena's reputation. Although, because he was not selected first among the consul elects to speak when Cicero was trying to decide how to punish the Catalinarian conspirators, I do think there is some reason to believe that due to the dusty finish of the consular election, that Murena's uh, colleague Silanus was a little better regarded and had a little more prestige at the time. But that could just be an accident since Cicero had to call him one of the two consul elects and there was a 50-50 shot that he wouldn't choose Murena to begin with. So make of that what you will. As consuls, Murena and Silanus worked well together. However, they were both overshadowed by other men that year. Pompey was on the cusp of returning from the east after years away on campaign. He had greatly added to the size of the Republic, and many men in the Senate were deeply apprehensive about his return. Some of them felt that when he returned, his influence would be so overweening that their political ambitions would be quelched. He would simply have so much honor and authority that they would not be able to compete, and the balance of the Senate would be thrown off so greatly that 
that it would no longer be a council of more or less equal elites, but rather a council with Pompey far above everyone else. So men in the Senate were trying to scramble to figure out whether they would align themselves with Pompey or find ways to oppose him and bring him back down to their size. That was what many Roman senators were trying to figure out during this year. As for the day-to-day -day news, this was more or less dominated by accusations and trials against suspected Catalinarians, most of whom were accused by Cicero, who made it sort of his brand to be the Catiline guy. As someone who had investigated and prosecuted Catiline originally, Cicero thought that it was incumbent upon him to use his position and his skills to hunt down the people who had fled the ship before it sank and make sure that they were punished in some way. That being said, Cicero also was in a good position to save people who he thought were unjustly accused, and this led to his defense of Publius Sulla, the nephew of the famous dictator, when he was accused of being a Catalinarian. However, uh, Sulla's old would-be consular colleague Publius Atronius Paetus was a lot less lucky, and he was convicted and then exiled to Epirus. So this year had some witch hunts and it also had some fears of Pompey's return. It was a year of anxiety and there was some action, but this was a year which was mostly just um, connecting the Catalinarian conspiracy in 63 and the return of Pompey in 61. In and in of itself, it was very much a transitional year and not one which was terribly memorable. While Murina and Silanus were overshadowed by other men in Rome, they did pass one highly significant piece of legislation, the Lex Junia Licinia. This law built on an earlier law from 98, which banned irrelevant writers to bills and also mandated a minimum three-week gap between a law's proposal and then its presentation before an assembly for ratification. The idea here effectively was to slow down the legislative process, and the justification was that it would lead to wiser decision-making as it would allow passions to cool and lead to a wiser government. In reality, the idea was to allow crowds to disperse and the Senate to react against legislation that it didn't like. The idea was to increase the control of the elite to some extent. But more to the point, there was an actual target of this law. Remember earlier when I said that many people in the Senate were trying to figure out how to cut Pompey down the size so that way the overall authority of the Senate as a block would not be threatened by his individual brilliance and prestige. Well, this was one way to do that. The idea is that it allows obstructionism to a greater extent than would otherwise be the case. Pompey assumed that when he got back to Rome that the Senate would give him what he wanted in terms of ratifying his settlements in the East and also providing land for the many veterans he was bringing back. But many in the Senate, especially people like Cato, had other ideas. They thought that obstructing Pompey was the only way to prevent him from becoming too politically dominant and undermining their own authority. And this law was one tool in the toolbox since it enabled the Senate to impose arbitrary um, delays in the passage of legislation. And because some of Pompey's veterans were now unemployed, they couldn't necessarily afford to hang out in the city for nearly a month after pressing the Senate for uh, reforms and then having to stick around to actually vote for them. So this made things a lot harder for people such as Pompey. Tactics such as the Lex Junia Licinia and obstructionism more broadly would eventually force Pompey to make amends with his old enemy Crassus and also form an alliance with Gaius Julius Caesar to form the first triumvirate. So while this law by itself does not necessarily lead to that, I think it does have at least some impact. So in that sense, you could say that Murina did have an impact on the politics of this period and that he was probably aligned with the people who were trying to figure out a way to put some speed bumps in Pompey's path. Although I think given what happens during the first triumvirate, it's very safe to say 
that this strategy ended up backfiring in royal fashion. No pun intended, given what happens after Julius Caesar. After he left the consulship, Lucius Murina fades into obscurity, and the historical sources don't mention him again. It's likely that he died relatively soon after his consulship was concluded. His son, Lucius Licinius Varro Murina, was adopted out to the Varro family, which implies that Murina was not around when his son was still a minor. This son later grew up to become a prominent member of the early imperial senate, but then he got into a feud with Augustus and paid for it with his life. That is another story for another day, and I think a quite fascinating one. Effectively, Lucius Licinius Murina's legacy was that of a successful legate and minor consul who was then immortalized by a surviving defense speech sort of the accident of Cicero deciding that this speech best exemplified his skills, and then that speech actually being preserved by a later copyist, has meant that we know more about Lucius Murina than we know about a lot of other people who were almost certainly more significant. A lot of scholars assume that Murina was guilty of ambitus, I'm one of them actually, and that his successful defense implies that lawyers and political considerations were often effectively more important than the laws as written. So if you're looking for a reason to be cynical about how Roman politics works, I think that the case of Murina is a pretty good piece of evidence for that particular claim. Effectively, Murina is literally just the guy who beat Catiline for the consulship of 62 and thereby pushed him over the edge. Murina may not have been a part of the Catalinarian conspiracy at all, in fact, he was aligned with the opposite faction, but you could make the case that he was the catalyst, or at least the instrument by which Cicero and the Optimates eventually drove Catiline to a level of desperation sufficient for him to try to fulfill all of their worst fears. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian. Let me know in the comments below who you'd like to see me cover next. I'm open to suggestions but I'll probably already be working on somebody by the time I read your comment, so feel free to let me know anyway, though. Peace out.